Hello, everybody, and hello, everyone, and uh, welcome you on today's webinar. And it's very, very special to me personally, and because of many reasons. One of these reasons are very special, and it's the number of people participating today. And it's really incredible to see how many people are interested in African issues. But honestly, I'm not surprised because the, this today webinar was uh, inspired by session what we did with these speakers, with today's speakers in Lisbon. And uh, it's not secret that organizers uh, expected just very little number of people there. But at the end, people were not able to sit because we didn't have enough chairs. So the same situation is today and it's repeated, history is repeated. And uh, I would like to welcome you and uh, uh, the, the issue related to African situation, African uh, universities and training programs for addiction workforce is something what is, I think, and, and I think that many people are slightly underestimating these issues, but in fact, uh, there are many things that are happening there. And uh, the history is not maybe so long, but you can see today very proud journal, African Journal of Drug and Alcohol Studies. You can see many university teams and training institutes uh, developing, testing and, and, and providing very nice program. And today I have a it's great honor and I have this honor to introduce you with three speakers who are truly uh, leaders, uh, leaders in this region and um, they will introduce you with their teams, with their work. First speaker is uh, Beatrice Katungu, uh, lecturer from Department of Psychology from Kenyatta University in Nairobi. And before her speech, I would like to express my special thanks towards ICUDTR and International Society of Substance Use Professionals and three of my colleagues, uh, Radolf Notway, uh, Olivia Vutro, and, and Kerry Hopkins for organizing and supporting today's session. So enjoy it. And Beatrice, if you can prepare your first presentation and introduce us with the situation on African continent from the general perspective and, and, and especially with special focus on, on your own work and your team in Nairobi. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mikal. I hope you can hear me. Please Very confirm well. that you can hear me. We can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Very well. Thank you very much. So thank you, Professor Mikal, for this opportunity to share what we are doing in Africa. I want to express gratitude to ICUDDR and ISAP for the thought of putting together this webinar to give us an opportunity from Africa, ICUDDR, to share what it is that we are doing in our continent. And I acknowledge the support that we have received from the different organizations. Um, I work at Kenyatta University in the Department of Psychology, but I also coordinate the leadership of ICUDDR in Africa, and I'm happy to have two of the leaders with me here, Martin and Rihanna. And so I'm going to be sharing with you a journey that we have walked as a continent in our zeal to develop the addiction workforce in Africa in the realization that we cannot overcome or we cannot succeed in the work against drug demand reduction, in the work towards preventing drug abuse, if we do not develop the workforce, if we do not professionalize the field. And so I'm going to be sharing with you how we have piloted what we call an implementation protocol and how we delivered it through the COVID times and where we are right now as a continent. Of course, our desire to be involved in these um, activities was informed by what is happening at the global level, at the regional level, and even in our local countries and our specific universities. I think we are aware of the statistics around drugs and drug use and drug use disorders worldwide, and the increase in the last decade that makes us very keen to do something about the problem. We know that a good number of the people that are injecting drugs will suffer from hepatitis C and other blood-borne diseases. 
and some will even suffer from both conditions. And that means that for countries in Africa where the burden of disease and the resource is high and the resources are constrained, then the problem gets very complicated. And that then means that we need to be concerned coming from Africa. Now, Africa is a vast continent. For those of us who may not know well, we are over 50 countries. We are over 1.3 billion people. We stretch all the way from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean, which also then means that there's a high risk not only of drugs being uh, produced in the continent, but also being trafficked across, um, you know, via the continent. UNODC reports have emphasized the problem of drug use in Africa. Um, reports have indicated that as much as 40% of people have used or will have used drugs by 2030 because we have younger populations, we have a big population growth, and majority of these people may not be treated. And many of them are actually under 35 years old, meaning that they are productive citizens of their countries. And therefore, unless we make an intervention very, very uh, seriously, we are likely to have a big negative impact in Africa. And therefore, we as universities in Africa have risen to the calling and we want to be part of the narrative that tries to address the problem in terms of prevention, in terms of treatment, in terms of recovery support and other public health interventions, including influencing policies in our own countries and in our regions. Now, a good number of the things that happen in Africa is that we do have efforts at addressing the problem of drugs and drug use and drug use disorders. But a good part of what has been happening is that we don't have a lot of evidence generation. And so what we do may not necessarily be backed by evidence. And as a result of this, there's a lot of stigmatization of people who have uh, substance use disorders. We have a lot of sometimes discrimination and patients are seen as just simply lacking willingness to change because of limited understanding of the problem of substance use disorder. And therefore, we have limited opportunities for interventions. And uh, because of this, then a couple of things we are witnessing in our countries, where you have got frustrated clients and their families, where you have failed prevention and treatment efforts because of use of non-evidence-based methods and practices, resulting in wasted resources for individuals, families, communities, and countries. And a good bunch of people have generally just lost faith in interventions that are being put in place for substance use disorders. Now, even insurance you know, um, coverage for health is afraid of covering um, conditions related to substance use disorders because of lack of faith in the interventions that we have. And as a result of all these, then we have poor client outcomes. And because of this, then we have seen a need as universities in Africa to address the whole idea of how to make sure that there's access to evidence-based interventions in Africa. And we do appreciate that there's a lot of literature that does tell us that we need to offer continuum of prevention. We need to offer appropriate and timely screening um, assessment and placement. We do need holistic treatment and we do need support for long-term recovery, as well as, you know, evidences that are supporting policies in our countries. We do believe as universities in Africa that if we do this, we will have better outcomes for our clients. We will have reduction in wasted resources. We will have increase in faith or increased faith in treatment for substance use disorders and the prevention interventions we put in place. And we are therefore likely to attract more stakeholders to support you know, clients, whether with regard to prevention, with regard to treatment and even recovery support. We do acknowledge that a lot of work has been put in place by the INL through um, uh, the different interventions. So we want to thank the US uh, State Department for the partnership with Colombo Plan, for the partnership with ISAP and ICUDDR to ensure that some efforts are happening at a global uh, level and trickling down to our regions and our countries. Uh, we notice that um, a lot of this is targeting a wide range of professionals in the field of SUD and uh, ranging all the way from prevention, treatment, recovery support. A good number of our countries have been able 
to actually benefit from the universal prevention curriculum, the universal treatment curriculum, and even the recovery um, curriculum, as well as the special curricula like the women and the child um, curricula that have been developed, and we appreciate that. However, we do notice that these efforts on their own may not help achieve our desire to have a continent where we are practicing evidence-based practices. And therefore, we think of universities as the niche that we need to take advantage of so that we can do much more and in a sustainable way. And therefore, by tapping into what is already existing in universities, there's much more we can achieve um, as stakeholders. And one of the reasons why we advocate for universities involvement is that we do know that universities core mandate is education and training. Within universities, we already have quality um, you know, mechanisms of um, you know, quality education, monitoring, evaluation. We already have existing resources, whether it's the infrastructure in terms of lecture halls, ICT and learning management systems, you know, the faculty, which have a certain level of capacity that just requires upscaling. And therefore, we could actually take or tap into this to be able to make a difference. And therefore, through ICUDDR, we are picking what we are calling a sustainability strategy. We are thinking that universities can offer a more sustainable way for disseminating evidence-based uh, practices and, and evidence-based knowledge so that when we finally look at our countries, we can see a difference. We can see people practicing with evidence, with knowledge, with skills, with competencies, and that can then translate into improved outcomes. And therefore, as universities, we are committed with support from ICUDDR to make this evidence-based knowledge available and accessible. And this we do by developing and implementing what we are calling academic university-based drug demand reduction programs, or sometimes we call them addiction science programs. And these ones can target both people already in the field as practitioners, and we offer that as continuing education, and it can also be pre-service education to potential practitioners in the, in the, that may come to the field of DDR or allied disciplines that are already offering programs. Now, we're doing this through ICU-DDR, and we uh, have acknowledged that ICU-DDR plays a very important role in promoting the transfer and adaptation of this knowledge into programs within universities. And they have supported the adaptation of UTCs and UPCs into university-based academic programs. And I want to share a little about our model in Africa. So after putting in place several strategies, we have been able to consolidate these strategies into what we are seeing as a sustainable approach for Africa. And it has got six steps. The first step is that we identify what we call strategic university faculty. Now, a strategic university faculty is a person that's willing to become a champion, a person that has passion for making a difference in the field of drug demand reduction. And once we have identified this faculty, we put them together and conduct what we call a walkthrough. Now, the walkthrough is a capacity building, which is supposed to make them familiar with the UPCs, the UTCs, with a view to helping them begin to think about how this can be adapted into a program that can be offered in a university. Now, once we do that, in the third step, we do what we call a needs assessment for program development. In the needs assessment for program development, we are focusing on assessing the capacity of this faculty to develop programs. They may have the knowledge of the evidence-based practices and competencies and skills. They may have the knowledge about UPC and UTC, but we now want them to be able to translate that into a university program. And we do know that university programs are rigorous. There's a lot of threshold that must be met in terms of uh, approvals, in terms of meeting requirements of the institutions, of the regulators, and even sometimes um, of specific bodies that work in those countries. And therefore, we do a needs assessment, and we already have a tool in place that we are using. And then in the fourth step, we do the actual capacity building for program development. Now, this again, we have been able to do, and I'll be talking about that, uh, what we have been able to do in that area. And then the next stage, we do the actual development and implementation of programs. And as you, ICUDDR, we are actually supporting universities that are interested in developing the programs, and we're giving them technical support. We are benchmarking, we are sharing knowledge and information. And at the sixth stage then, we actually want to take it a step higher 
having developed programs, having implemented programs, we want to check the impact of these programs on practice. How are they translating? Or how is this training translating into improved outcomes, whether it's in prevention, whether it's in treatment, whether it is in recovery support and related areas. So that is our model. And so I now would like to just uh, share a little of what we have done. Uh, we have already been able to do, we held what we called a catalytic meeting in, uh, in um, Addis Ababa. And the purpose of this meeting was to put together the members or potential members of ICUDDR to be able to come up with a leadership structure and that leadership structure is made up of the regional leaders you know the leaders of the continent uh, chaired by myself i have a vice that's called martin and is in the house we have a secretary that's rihanna and in the house and this leadership steers the continent through a lower level of leadership at the various regions from the west the east the north and the south and that has helped us to achieve a lot in terms of this goal and therefore what i'm really trying to say is if we want to achieve in terms of you know being part of building capacity being um, you know developing programs we have to think about the leadership of the regions and through this leadership we were able to organize a walkthrough for universities in africa we have also been able to do a continental needs assessment of many universities across the continent and part of this helped us to see what were the gaps that needed to be addressed and these were some of the needs that came out many of them wanted to know how do you even decide on an academic program how do you do a needs assessment to develop that program and i'm happy that one of our presenters today dr rihanna will actually be addressing their experience on how to uh, empower universities to conduct a needs assessment they also said they wanted to know how do you ensure your program meets university requirements how do you determine the level of the program? Is it an undergraduate? Is it a postgraduate? They also wanted to know, how do you mobilize resources? How do you then develop the courses that are relevant and meet the needs that have been identified? How do you monitor and evaluate academic programs? So this came out as, you know, what are the needs that we needed in African universities to be able to develop academic programs? And as a result of that, uh, it was important to develop a course whose purpose was to build the capacity of the faculty to develop academic programs. Of course, it's anchored on the identified needs. It has been developed with support from ICUDDR, and we are very thankful for that. And this is a rich course that has got seven modules. Now, the modular approach allows a faculty or a group of faculty from one university or many universities to select based on their needs what module they want to cover now these modules are addressing each and every one of the needs that was identified from the needs assessment so module one for example looks at how do you gather um, input from potential stakeholders of your program to develop an academic program a ddr related academic program the second module looks at how we develop the goals of a program, the objectives of a program, and how we align them to the goals and objectives of the university. The third module looks at how we can determine the academic program nature. So are we going to roll out or develop a prevention-based, is it a treatment-based, or is it a combination of both? Who will be our target population? At what level shall we pitch that program? So that's what the third module addresses the fourth module is what we call the real cooking it addresses um, information on how to construct the actual courses and how to ensure that the courses that you construct are aligned to the program learning outcomes which are aligned to the needs of the target population in the fifth module we look at how we ensure that the program we have developed is aligned to the university requirements a lot of universities have requirements for programs. Sometimes we have uh, professional bodies that regulate the programs in their countries. They have their requirements. Sometimes we have got what we call uh, the national bodies that regulate education. They have their requirements. So module five helps faculty to understand how to align their DDR academic program to all these requirements. The sixth module 
addresses a critical issue of how do we mobilize resources, resources to support academic program development, whether it is human resource, financial uh, resources, uh, infrastructure, and many others, technical expertise. That's what that module is about. And finally, the seventh module looks at how we monitor and evaluate academic programs. So that is our course that is available and it is available online. And we had the privilege of piloting this course. It was actually supposed to be a face-to-face, -face, but due to COVID, it was done online. And we are happy to say that during that training or that pilot training, we had trainer-led presentations. We had practical group assignments. We had collaborative learning. We had a lot of feedback from the trainers and the peers. We used a learning management system called Health Knowledge, and that helped us to increase access to this course. We used many platforms besides the LMS. We had WebEx, we had emails, we had um, WhatsApp as communication, we had Google Drive, and all this meant that we had a lot of flexibility when we were trying to roll out that course. We delivered it weekly, two hours per week, and it was often done in the evening to accommodate the faculty work schedules, which are really busy. Initially, we thought we'd go for 53 hours, but it actually stretched for 70 hours, which ended up being 35 weeks. That was quite a long haul. And uh, we, it was very attractive to participants because of the flexibility, the practical nature of the material, and that they could get certified after each module and also at the end of the whole course, if they covered the whole course. Now, because of that, we have made several achievements. About six countries completed this training. Many have started using the material, the rich experiences that they gained, and they are adapting that knowledge to their unique contexts. These are some of the countries that we reached. Uh, like you can see from this map, we held South Africa, we had Botswana, Malawi, we had Uganda, we had Nigeria, we had Kenya. Some of the challenges we faced, of course, I've talked about the long haul, We've talked about the busy schedules of the faculty, some few dropped out, completing assignments in virtual space was a challenge, but we learned many lessons, perhaps the need to cluster the modules and do intensive training, and people can take breaks in between. Of course, we learned the value of collaborative learning. What are we thinking about going forward? We are now reviewing the modules based on the pilot feedback, and this should be completed by May 2023, we are rolling out that course to more faculty that are interested in Africa and beyond. This should happen this year before September 2023. And we are also beginning to start evaluating the impact of the course, whether it's immediate or long term in terms of development of the academic programs. We also want to scale up capacity building for more faculty, and we want to support rollout of programs by individual countries and individual universities, as we also begin to sensitize universities and countries to invest more in the drug demand reduction related programs. I wish in a very special way to acknowledge our partners. I have mentioned ICUDDR, INL, ISAP, Colombo Planned Up, the regional leaders, the African Union, the individual countries and their participants, including the universities and the African coordinating team of leaders. It is because of their contribution that we have been able to make these great strides. I do recognize that if we continue collaborating together, we can achieve much more. I thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Beatrice, for your excellent first presentation for today. And I see first comments and questions, but we will have a uh, join discussion at the end of our today's session. So we will proceed to the second speaker, Martin Agovi, founder and executive director from Global Initiative of uh, uh, on Substance Abuse, GSA, uh, from Lagos, Nigeria, and he will speak about uh, addiction curricula in Nigeria. And uh, I can say that it was pretty nice work with Nigerian colleagues, and uh, they were very. Uh, uh, enthusiastic and, and highly motivated uh, in, in uh, taking information about uh, new curricula and in trainings. I was always very happy to work uh, with all of them. So Martin, if you can prepare your presentation and, and we can start with your time and microphone is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mika. 
uh, for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, please confirm if you can see my slide. Please, can you see my slide? Not yet. Yes. yes. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. So once again, uh, thank you, uh, Mikhail, for uh, moderating this uh, webinar. And uh, thanks to all the attendees for being here. Uh, briefly, I will be speaking on addiction curriculum in Nigerian higher education system, context contextualizing Western-based methods and approaches for responsiveness and effectiveness. Uh, Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa and seventh uh, in the world. It's a country that uh, the youth and the children population uh, is, uh, of course, the youth and children population in, uh, in Nigeria is one of the highest uh, uh, in the world. So uh, about 70 percent of the population is below the age of uh, 30. So it's one of the countries in the world with the largest uh, youth and children uh, population. And of course, there is a burden of uh, uh, drug use and uh, drug use uh, disorders uh, with above 14% uh, uh, drug use prevalence among the adult uh, population and uh, almost uh, three uh, times uh, the global uh, prevalence. And despite this uh, high burden of substance use disorders, uh, access to treatment is low uh, compared to need. And one of the reasons uh, for the low uh, uh, treatment rate is because of uh, limited uh, workforce. And this is also complicated by the uh, brain drain. So health and social welfare training programs uh, often do not uh, include uh, specialized uh, training in, uh, in substance use disorders and uh, uh, coupled with lack of uh, certified courses in addiction as well as uh, credentialing uh, process. Uh, this, of course, is of uh, nationwide uh, systemic uh, concern. So, and uh, one of the ways uh, to address these uh, concerns uh, is uh, building a uh, health workforce and uh, strengthening the, the available uh, human uh, resources uh, through uh, capacity building, you know, uh, through a range of uh, menu of courses uh, for competency-based uh, multidisciplinary roles in addiction science. It also involved uh, contextualizing Western-based models of pedagogy in order to develop uh, addiction study curriculum that is sensitive and, of course, uh, responsive to both uh, local and uh, national uh, needs. Uh, it is against this uh, background and uh, rationale that this uh, presentation highlights uh, a, a co-produced uh, curriculum for addiction studies in Nigerian higher education uh, system. Uh, prior to the uh, introduction of uh, ICUDDR to Nigeria, uh, there have been efforts by both uh, local and international organizations uh, to conduct uh, trainings in substance use uh, prevention, treatment, and recovery. Uh, this uh, basically were through uh, government and non-governmental organizations and so on. And uh, those who uh, attempted uh, to, to address or to overcome the, the knowledge gaps and skills in addiction science uh, attended uh, uh, these trainings, uh, which in most cases were occasional and, uh, and unsystematic. Uh, no university uh, offered addiction studies, you know, except for uh, some uh, uh, universities uh, who offer uh, topics in, in uh, uh, courses like social sciences and, uh, and medicine. Uh, similarly, there were no uh, guidelines on, uh, uh, on, on competencies, you know, uh, and mostly rely severely on internationally accredited uh, curricula uh, that in most cases uh, lacked uh, uh, context contextualization. So some of these interventions also were uh, at the early stage and uh, with a limited uh, uh, evaluation. But
through the introduction of uh, ISOP and ICU Digital to Nigeria, and of course uh, with uh, increased uh, membership and interest of uh, drug demand reduction practitioners in Nigeria, uh, this exposed practitioners uh, to international knowledge on uh, evidence-based uh, service uh, delivery. Uh, this also increased uh, the involvement and interest of universities in Nigeria in developing academic programs in addiction uh, studies. Uh, just like I said uh, prior to, uh, like I said earlier, prior to uh, 2018, uh, when ICDDR was introduced to Nigeria, uh, no academic program, whether at the diploma level or at the postgraduate level, uh, were offered in, in, in Nigeria universities. But as of today, as I speak with you, uh, two universities in Nigeria offer additional studies at postgraduate uh, levels. As we may all know too, uh, central to workforce development is curriculum. And what we did in developing uh, the, the, this uh, blueprint uh, for Nigeria uh, was to review uh, uh, different uh, courses relating to uh, the field of uh, addiction uh, science. And we also uh, reviewed uh, the UPC and uh, UTC curricula. And of course, uh, we did an uh, in-depth uh, interviews uh, through uh, focus group discussions among stakeholders in Nigeria. So this process uh, created uh, awareness about uh, the need uh, the, to contextualize uh, Western inputs and local realities, and of course, establish uh, a theory-driven process uh, for identifying barriers and opportunities uh, that may arise in the course of developing uh, additional curriculum uh, in, in Nigeria. And of this provided an overview you know, uh, based on the collaborative uh, uh, collaboration that is expected in the field of uh, addition and also partnering with uh, uh, institutions. And of course, this was developed uh, in collaboration with the ICUDDR and in accordance with the Bolina uh, Declaration. Other materials or model, curriculum models that we reviewed uh, includes uh, the, the subject-based model, uh, the expressive model, the problem-based model, objective model, as well as uh, the humanistic educative uh, approach. But after reviewing all of these models, uh, looking at the, the merits and the, the merits, uh, uh, none of uh, them uh, was wholly uh, uh, selected or, or adapted. We also reviewed uh, the six major areas uh, covered in the uh, WHO uh, uh, health system building block, uh, which include uh, uh, health workforce, health information systems, uh, health service delivery, access to essential medicines, health systems financing, as well as leadership and, uh, and governance. But after reviewing these uh, uh, areas of, of uh, uh, building blocks, uh, we discovered that uh, uh, strengthening the, the health workforce uh, will help in addressing uh, the drug and substance use challenge in Nigeria. So this includes uh, building uh, capacity, that is uh, the improving the, the, the human resources. Uh, through uh, evidence-based substance use uh, legislation or that we promote evidence-based substance use legislation and policies. Also, uh, pre-service training curriculum, uh, in-service training with locally contextualized tools, then uh, continuing in-service training and mentorship. And of course, uh, capacity building for mentoring and evaluation as well as linkages with international partners, which of course is very important. What were our priorities? Our priorities were to develop competency-based rules uh, with continuing education and transition into addiction specialists. Uh, this also includes a multi-professional course uh, that would lead to widely uh, accepted uh, national certification in, in substances prevention and treatment that is also appropriate uh, for uh, professions with regulatory bodies through uh, collaboration. So we also looked at the studies program that will undoubtedly uh, have an immense impact on the professionalization of the Nigerian addition uh, workforce. Then last but not the least uh, here is uh, to have a more coordinated response to the drug menace in Nigeria. 
Then among the priorities still uh, is, to, is to develop uh, structural mechanisms, you know, to support universities in different areas, such as uh, specialized journals, uh, research centers, uh, education programs, uh, training, uh, professional societies, and of course, uh, building a strong institution for the profession. Uh, the team that developed uh, this uh, curriculum uh, 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 experts uh, from um, uh, universities in four out of the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria and uh, an NGO. Uh, these experts uh, developed uh, or formulated the aims and learning outcomes uh, of a competence-based curriculum and in line with the BTS uh, model. So uh, the team uh, used uh, uh, mapping you know, uh, of, of key uh, educational uh, program uh, uh, in line with the concept required to meet the aims and objectives. And it also included uh, uh, the I IMPG uh, model. This was put into consideration too. Then talking about the BTS model, what does this entail? Uh, it is an approach uh, that creates an environment that promotes uh, creativity, uh, reflective learning, uh, critical thinking, interpersonal relationship, uh, as well as attitude change through uh, process uh, uh, learning. It, it is also a model uh, that encourages interaction process around the, the curriculum content uh, rather than the uh, content itself. And it also facilitates uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. And uh, it is a holistic uh, framework that puts into consideration uh, cultural issues, uh, different stakeholders, and also uh, considering uh, uh, recovery capital, especially in the area of treatment. The, the key steps in beauty's model briefly uh, include uh, uh, drawing up a map of key uh, subjects, uh, compiling a, a schedule of basic skills needed, uh, assembling a, priori, a portfolio of meaningful experiences to guide learnings, and of course, constructing an agenda of important uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, issues. So all these uh, were done uh, through uh, 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 key uh, stakeholder analysis and uh, of course, through in-depth uh, uh, interview. Talking about the cultural considerations, which of course is very important in curriculum development, uh, we also looked at uh, the UPC and UTC uh, to identify cultural gaps to expect when incorporating them in our new uh, curriculums. And uh, I must say that uh, this step highlighted the promise of improving uh, curricular quality and adoption uh, rates. So on, in considering uh, uh, a culture, uh, looking at the cultural issues, our focus was mainly on uh, social, uh, ethical, and the political uh, issues, also not uh, uh, overlooking the aspect of a long-term disagreement uh, that exists around the uh, topic of health, which is not peculiar to Nigeria. Uh, experts have different perceptions and approach to health-related uh, issues. In terms of knowledge and skills uh, needed, uh, we, we felt that uh, uh, in this field, uh, uh, at the uh, higher education level, uh, uh, students should have sound knowledge of pharmacology, epidemiology, medicine, public health, uh, health education and prevention, health psychology, social policy and context, uh, treatment issues, and of course, legal uh, aspects, which of course is peculiar uh, from one country uh, to the other. So we also identified three levels of, uh, of, uh, of courses, uh, which we, uh, we, we, we broke down into three, that is the basic, intermediate, and advanced level uh, courses. Uh, for the basic level courses, uh, we identified uh, the ph uh, physiology and pharmacology of drugs, the continuum of care, among others. And uh, at the master's and PhD level, uh, we also looked at uh, similar courses, but at in-depth uh, level. And we included the uh, courses uh, uh, that deal with uh, special population uh, groups, as well as trauma-informed care. 
So at each of these levels, uh, diploma, masters, and PhD, uh, the, the, the core competencies uh, will be graded uh, and in different uh, in scaffolds, such as analytic uh, assessment, uh, cultural competency skills, uh, management skills, uh, policy development skills, and of course, uh, basic public health skills in SUD. Again, we can overemphasize the importance of uh, cultural competency in this. So at the end, uh, students will need to achieve uh, competencies in each domain at one of the three levels, which of course we, we said uh, awareness, uh, knowledge, and proficiency. The awareness level we term as more of a generic. Uh, at the knowledge level, the learner has an intermediate level of mastery of the competency. Then at the proficiency level, the learner can synthesize, uh, critique, or teach the skill. So uh, at each of these levels, we, uh, we feel the generalist role will be more of the, uh, the diploma level, a specialist manager role at master's level, and the consultant role at the PhD uh, level. Duration of programs, uh, we, 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 we recommended uh, that at the basic level, it should be 1,500 hours. At the master's level, uh, full-time 3,000 hours, and at the PhD level, uh, uh, full-time 6,400 hours. We were also uh, sensitive to peculiarities in different disciplines, such as medicine, psychology, nursing, pharmacy, and, uh, and social work. So we feel that um, the, the, the addiction field is not so uh, overshadow any of this field, but it is important that the, the, the theory or the foundational theory of all this uh, discipline uh, should, be, should be respected more so that all courses are developed uh, through a system or ecological uh, perspective and the adoption of a strength perspective. We also consider the students' lived uh, experience, which is very important because we're talking about adults here. Their interests, experiences, and needs are very important in developing a curriculum. We feel that this is very important as part of a, a review. Uh, as we may all know, too, uh, a curriculum uh, seems not to be adequate without provision for evaluation. So uh, we felt uh, the CIPP model, which of course uh, is, uh, is well recognized, is worthwhile when it comes to evaluation for this curriculum. We also felt that there was no need to reinvent uh, the wheel as uh, different uh, uh, models have been proposed before now, uh, looking at the Herrick and colleagues uh, model, as well as the Chavat and colleagues uh, model. So all of these models uh, have been, have, have been uh, uh, looked into and, uh, uh, and, and followed in the course of developing uh, this uh, curriculum without reinventing uh, the wheel. So within the, this perspective, as I begin to round up, uh, a continuum of three levels of higher education of addiction studies uh, will provide the key to building the requisite trust for successful learning, uh, mobility, cross-boundary academic cooperation, and forum for international uh, uh, dialogue. And of course, we, we, we envision that um, uh, a continuum of service you know, that is accessible to a broad range of stakeholders will stimulate expansion of uh, competent addiction workforce in Nigeria. And we also believe that through this uh, model, uh, we'll be able to professionalize the field of uh, uh, addiction science in Nigeria. And of course, uh, 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 Development of curriculum does not just end there, or uh, graduating with uh, degrees in addition does not end there if there are no employment opportunities. This we have also found to be available in Nigeria, both at the, at the, at the government, private, and NGO levels. Well, there are still bridges to cross, and one of which is uh, limited support and buy-ins uh, from academic and government institutions, uh, issues relating to regulatory and uh, accreditation bodies, uh, collaborative relationships across uh, uh, agencies, uh, limited investment in the training by government bodies, 
then the capacity for supervision, and of course, differences in practice, in work setting and training environment. And the last but not the least here, funding, which of course is really very important. So in conclusion, I would say uh, the fact that the uh, addiction science has not been developed as a university program in Nigeria before now, also reflects uh, the low estimation of addiction science as a strategy for addressing the burden of drug use in, in Nigeria. Uh, so uh, this uh, milestone, and that is the development of this uh, blueprint uh, in collaboration with ICDDR and in accordance with the Poligna Declaration is a step in the right uh, direction. And we hope that uh, other countries and uh, partners uh, who are interested in this model can also key into what we have done. And before I say uh, thank you, uh, let me quickly acknowledge uh, my colleagues with whom we work together to develop this uh, curriculum. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Martin, for your very nice overview of what is happening now in Nigeria. And it's, as I said before, it's really impressive how big this group is and how many universities are responding positively to this call. And for those of you uh, today who are interested in African programs and what universities are operating, what and where, uh, it's three years ago uh, when we published analysis of African universities and college with operating, uh, really operating today, uh, existing programs on African continent. And it was published in Substance Use uh, Journal, uh, edited uh, by Richard Professor Richard Pates, who is in cooperation with many of you. And uh, this analysis of existing programs is available. And I think that it can be pretty useful for those of you who are interested or thinking about, uh, about future programs. So thanks so much again, Martin, for your presentation. And we will proceed uh, to our uh, uh, third speaker, who is Rehana Kader. Uh, thanks. Uh, from Life Vincent Piloti Hospital and uh, Randebosch Medical Center in Cape Town in South Africa. And Rehana will speak about needs assessment and preparatory work for addiction science programs. And I can uh, say a couple of words about it because it was more than 10 years ago when I read for the first time uh, the very nice first papers about evaluations of, of some first training programs. That, and I was really excited and impressed that it's so highly professional and, and very nice methodology. And I, I, I think that this third presentation will be also very nice and interested because uh, I, I, I always are impre is impressed that the uh, professionality of, of your work is, is pretty nice and comp completely comparable to, to uh, uh, European universities or, or South American universities. So, Rihanna, space is yours, microphone, and, and you can start with your presentation. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Prof. Michael, for the introduction. Um, I will now share my screen. All right, so <clears throat> today my presentation will focus on a needs assessment that was conducted in South African universities, looking at what are the curriculum needs. So Beatrice and Martin, my colleagues, have done a great <clears throat> presentation in giving you an understanding of what the overall context of the continent is and the need for an addiction curriculum as well as for the professionalized workforce. In her, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bit of a flu. In her presentation, Beatrice gave you a framework of the different steps in terms of wanting to implement an addictions program. And I'm happy to say that we are, we've just currently completed the third step. So Beatrice mentioned the first step was identifying universities in your country, which we did. Then is to conduct a walkthrough training with your staff from the different universities, and this South Africa has completed. And the third step was to do a needs assessment to find out what are the particular needs. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about in, that we've done in South Africa. 
So as indicated by my previous colleagues, any curriculum development, you need, it's a process and one needs to start with a needs assessment because it's important for us to know what are the particular needs of universities. We cannot just assume and impose a curriculum on them. So hence, I'm going to give you an overview of the methodology we used, the results we've got, and some of the recommendations in terms of how we go on to the fourth stage is where we start implementing the program. Research conducted in South Africa and what I've heard from Beatrice and Martin again in the continent is that treatment rate remains low, although all our countries have a high prevalence of substance use. And the reason or the question was asked, why is treatment rates so low if we have such a high prevalence of substance use? And the explanation that we found out or from research was that this was due to a lack of expertise among professionals in substance use disorders. And this was quite a problem for our country because the health professionals, and I'm particularly talking about doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists in South Africa, are trained very generic generically in substance use disorders. So there isn't a speciality as such. So as Beatrice indicated and Martin, what better way to start professionalizing the workforce, but to start with the universities, because this is where we train people to become professionals in the field. And I think this is in line with the mission of ICUDDR, where we want to ensure a professionalized workforce so that we effectively and competently provide the best treatment possible for people with substance use disorders and related conditions. So the brainchild of ICUDDR was Professor Mikhail Majowski and was founded in 2016. And the African continent started their chapter in 2019. Our country's specific objective was to do a needs assessment, which would inform implementation of a program. So what was the objectives for us to do the needs assessment, we wanted to know what's the current landscape in the country regarding addictions program. What we wanted to know was the perceptions of the academics in terms of them implementing a new specialized addiction uh, science program. Would they be keen? And we also wanted to get a sense of whether they would be keen for certification of transdisciplinary professionals. So not only looking at healthcare professionals, but looking across the board. And whether it is feasible, do, so do we need a UTC curriculum? Do we need a UPC curriculum? So these are some of the questions that we wanted answered so that we know what would be the next steps. The methodology that we use was a purpose of sampling. If you look at my screen, you'll see that that's a map of South Africa and we have nine provinces. And in each province, we have one university, up to three universities, up to five universities. So in the country, we have a total of 25 public universities. And of this, only 19 offers behavioral health sciences uh, courses or programs. And the needs assessment that we conducted, the response that we received was 17 out of these 19 universities, which is phenomenal for an online survey that only two universities didn't respond. So we were quite excited that the response indicated to us that universities are keen and are interested in an addiction science program. How did we collect the data? We used a structured Digitally item electronic survey, which was emailed to respondents. Aside from emailing it to respondents, we picked up the phone, we called them, we sent follow up emails, we developed a very personal relationship with these universities. And hence, I think we had such a high response rate because just sending off a survey, you know, your response rate is very low. So the importance of relationships was highlighted in the work that we did. 
And we use the implementation guide that was developed by ICU DDR, and it's on the website, which if you are keen on, you could go to the website and look at the implementation guide, which is extremely useful if you are thinking about implementing um, substance abuse curriculum at your university. So I just want to give you an example of some of the questions that we asked in the survey. We asked, do you know if your university offers any addiction science programs? And what kind of programs? Is it a course? Is it a module? Is it a degree? Is it a diploma? And then we also asked, what would be your objectives for wanting to consider such an addiction science program? Okay. We also wanted to know, what do you think are some of the challenges and the gaps and how do we overcome this? And Importantly, we wanted to know, does your university have the capacity and do you have people to teach an addiction science program? Um, yes, so I'm not going to go through the entire questionnaire. I'll just go through the last two or the last three. We asked them if external resources are offered by ICU DDR, would you be keen to receive these resources and help? And we also asked them would they be willing to utilize the UTC and the UPC curriculum. We had an overwhelming response with 37 responses from people, and this is across departments because we did it transdisciplinary. So although nine, 17 universities responded, but of that 17 universities, we had different faculties. So we had the medical faculty, we had the psychiatry faculty, we had the nursing faculty. Because we want to do a trans, transdisciplinary, different faculties were involved in this needs survey. And as you can see that the overwhelming response or the majority of response was from the psychology department where they offered some sort of training in addiction science which I think is not unusual. As psychologists, we are trained in some form of counseling and skills in addiction science. When we asked universities, what are the current forms of addiction science programs? Most universities offer a very short course or a module or a seminar. However, we have two universities in South Africa, and they're based in the city that I live in, Cape Town, which is the University of Cape Town and the University of Stellenbosch, where they have a very, very specialized postgraduate diploma in addictions. And that's only two universities out of the 25 public universities. So what are some of the gaps and challenges that our universities experience? <clears throat> Not surprisingly, we don't have enough qualified academics, as explained before. We don't have sufficient training opportunities in the country. Substance use is not a core teaching focus. And I think a very huge stumbling block, and I don't think this is unique to my country. I think it's overall in the continent, but in other countries as well, that whatever program we offer in addiction science does not lead to accreditation and if we want to professionalize addiction science it has to be recognized as a profession in its own right and i spoke about professionals being genetically trained in terms of capacity again if they have registered psychologists then there is some capacity however universities have full workloads um, they have some capacity to implement modules, but not an entire program. Again, short staff and resources, no budget. Finances is always a challenge for all universities. We need to upskill our trained staff, but there is a keen interest in the program that we want to offer. I think this was very interesting when we asked them, if they are willing to implement an addiction science program. And 95% of the university said, yes, we're ready and willing to go with the ICU DDR program of implementing a, a addiction science curriculum. And I think this was very, very encouraging for us as ICU DDR. Some of the objectives was that they want to develop a standalone program and majority indicated that they would want to start off with short courses because they don't have the capacity. They want to provide an overview of addictions 
And more importantly, we want to look at the standardized curriculum across the country. So we are all doing evidence-based practice science in terms of our treatments. Your time is running out, so I'll go very quickly. In terms of our cooperation, university said they would like ICUDDR to help them in building and improving the existing curriculum, to enhance staff teaching capabilities, and to inter enhance international collaboration with other universities in the world. Majority indicated that they would benefit from both the UTC and the UP. UPC that's offered by ICU-DDR. So we asked them who would be the potential candidates. And I don't think it's a surprise that the majority indicated that the first priority will be upskilling the existing professionals, because this would then cascade into the professionals teaching the postgraduates and undergraduate students in addiction science. Core competencies that they wanted was screening, and assessment tools, theories of addiction, evidence-based counseling, and understanding substance use in terms of co-occurring disorders. So in conclusion, yes, there's definitely a need for an addiction science program. The climate is right in our country because the universities are ready and rearing to go. The political and the government, real, the political climate is also right and government realizes the problem of SUD because South Africa was one of the countries that banned alcohol in COVID and what we found interestingly that once alcohol was banned there was a um, significant decrease in admissions to emergency rooms there was a significant decrease in violence in car accidents related to alcohol but once the ban was lifted there was an increase in all of this again so that is a glaring example that, yes, it's a problem in the country. We've conducted the walkthrough training. We've started implementing <clears throat> some of the modules into our universities, and ICUDDR has started providing the technical support. And yes, I think this is extremely exciting because Piet has presented the pyramid in terms of where we are going and the framework that we're following. We're almost up to the last or the pinnacle of the pyramid and achieving our objectives for ICU DDR. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues. It was a collaborative effort, which obviously, if you take any project, you need to collaborate. It cannot be done as an individual. And what we would like to see to be continued is that the need assessment can be replicated to other universities in the rest of the continent and we can see what the needs are and hopefully we can combine forces and provide a brilliant addiction science program in the African continent. So thank you all for listening and that's the end of my presentation. So nicely done. Thank you, Rehana. And we are in perfect time and all speakers kept our original time plans and thanks so much to all of you because it's always stressful to me <laughs> that we will have a problem so we have no problem today and we have very comfortable time for questions and uh, I listed what uh, you sent to us and I selected a couple of questions and I will start with, with the list before our oral questions. And the first question is to Beatrice. Uh, it's by Edwin. And uh, Edwin is ISAP member. And uh, the question is about joining you, uh, I mean, ICU DDR, because uh, there is a group of colleges. And the question is if colleges are acceptable as ICU DDR members. So uh, I think that it's perfect opportunity for promoting and inviting colleagues from uh, colleges. Beatrice, please. Thank you, Mikal. And yes, indeed, and I can see Carrie here is saying yes. You know, she's the <laughs> one that was on the other side. So I can confidently say, like Carrie, it's a yes. Um, of course, we talk about universities, but we are cognizant of the fact that we have got colleges that offer curriculum which is recognized in their universities and also accredited 
by accrediting organizations. And I think that is really what is important. So yes, we're going to have conversations and we welcome much more conversation after this presentation by those that are in colleges to see how we can uh, be part of this agenda. I do know that we do have one of the colleges in Kenya called SAPTA, and many of us are familiar with Dr. Um, yes, I just is my friend and his name sometimes just disappears. Maybe it's age related, but SAPTA is known support for addiction prevention and treatment in Africa. And yes, Bill, actually Bill, he's part of this. And um, we do work together in ICUDDR with that uh, organization. So yes, Edwin, most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. The second I question. I can add to that by yeah, saying if you want to go to ICUDDR.org. And on the top, there's a membership link and it'll say join us and you can very easily join as either a faculty member, an individual, which is a new option that we have available now, or if you're authorized to join as your university representative, wonderful, or you can do both. And it's a very simple form and uh, we respond back to you very quickly with letting you know that we received it and you know that you're, you're part of ICDDR now. Great, thank you, Carrie, for this additional clarification. And the second question is for Martin. Uh, Martin, it's about uh, regulatory authorities. And if you can explain uh, uh, how did you deal with regulatory authorities in Nigeria? And specifically, there is uh, mentioning and you see, uh, I don't know what specifically does it mean, but maybe you know, and maybe if you can explain uh, uh, how did you deal with it and with this issue, because I think that it's it's very general and all of us have to deal with uh, regulatory uh, authorities and it's always questionable how to avoid troubles and, and be successful with final accreditation and, and receiving permission to provide. And Martin, if you can, respond to this question thank you yes uh, thank you very much mika and uh, 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 thanks uh, for uh, asking this question the colleague who asked uh, nuc uh, stands for the nigeria universities commission it's a regulatory body for uh, programs uh, at the university uh, levels uh, so uh, well like i said in the course of my presentation sorry can you hear me? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay, sorry, I think there seems to be network uh, uh, fluctuations. So, I, like I said, the Nigeria University Commission, that is uh, what uh, the acronym NUC stands for. It's a regulatory body for uh, uh, academic programs in the, in the university. I identified that as one of the, the challenges, you know, as far as uh, uh, addiction programs uh, are concerned, or uh, addiction program in the university is concerned, because uh, you discover that um, uh, the gaps are there because it's a new field of, of learning in the university. So that also comes with its own uh, challenge. But uh, from experience and uh, from what is obtainable, uh, courses would have even started you know, before you invite uh, uh, accreditation uh, bodies to come and accredit the programs. So I can also uh, refer uh, a colleague to the two universities that have had, uh, that have been able to, to go through this uh, in Nigeria, the Niger Delta University and the uh, Inambi Azikiwe University in Nigeria. So these two universities, uh, you can also reach out to us. Uh, we'll give you a guide on how far they have gone in the accreditation process. And if there's any challenge, we'll let you know. But this is all part of what we are working through. So that at the end, at least we'll have these courses, you know, well accredited and certified. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, the next question is for Rehana. And in fact, it, uh, there are two questions. The first one is very simple. Uh, Rehana, you mentioned uh, response rate and you have a really high uh, response rate, what is usually a low point of many surveys. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that it's about um, your highly professional motivated work uh, with your colleagues 
or is it more about high motivation of your colleagues in, in South Africa? It, it's about your work it's, or it, about their high motivation? <laughs> It's, it's a combination, you know, it's 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 a combination of, of, of motivation from colleagues. Uh, it's the interest that's now peaking up in South Africa because we did the walkthrough and ICU DDR is becoming a very famous and familiar name in the country. But I think a lot of our work is driven by passion. And, you know, when you're passionate about something, you will do everything and I think that and, and, and relationships, uh, relationships are so important. I, I can't even emphasize. And I think that was why we had such a high response rate. Right, thank Passion you. Passion and relationships, like a love yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> Examples are the best, yeah. And uh, the second question is partially to you and, and partially to Beatrice because it's about scholarship. And if you can uh, say, um, uh, if your universities are providing scholarships or uh, if some general information you can provide about this issue in, in, in uh, South Africa or in Kenya. Uh, Martin, do you have a existing and operating program at this moment or it's about accreditation now in Nigeria? Um, Sorry, Mika, if I got you uh, right, uh, so universities are presently running academic program. Yeah, and yes. you, you plan providing uh, some scholarships for applicants or it's not option now? I uh, know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's fee paying, you know, the, the no scholarship for now. Yeah, and Rehana, if you can respond and then Beatrice. Yeah, so I think part of our ICUDDR objective is that we need to start looking at scholarships and exchange programs. And I think if people are interested is to join the ICUDDR because we are advocates for this. So, you know, we want to we want to build your capacity. So if you become an ICUDDR member and say you're interested in wanting to come to do a scholarship or a degree in South Africa, you have the South African chapter make contact with us. We will look at what's available and we will try to make that possible. And also our postgraduate diploma in addictions is online as well. So that's also an, uh, an option. But certainly that's one of the main objectives, not only of South Africa or the continent, but global ICUDDR is looking for scholarships for capacity building. Thank you. Beatrice, do you have uh, some scholarships? or it's not available oh it looks the connection was lost momentarily yeah okay we can respond later next question is how many universities in africa have started a degree program for drug addictions oh i see beatrice Beatrice, can you hear the, the former question about scholarships? Do, 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 is it something available in, in Kenya or not? Uh, sorry, I was kicked out by my network a little, so you may say that question one more time. Thank you. The question is if you are providing some scholarships and if some support, some kind of support is available for applicants for Kenyatta University or other universities in Kenya, if you can say something about it. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Mikal, and for the attendee that has asked that question. Uh, really, resources are one of the biggest challenges we have um, in our continent. I never want to discourage us from trying because I do know that sometimes different organizations may offer grants and within those grants, there could be students pulled in to study. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage people to join the programs. And faculty also works really hard in writing grant proposals. And perhaps one of the areas that we can benefit a lot is from some of the partners in this call, throwing in research grants. And as part of those research grants, having um, students included. And so, for example, I do know in our university, some of our master's students, not necessarily for the addiction program, have benefited from 
partial scholarships for their research projects through grants that have been awarded by organizations. For example, our National Authority for the Campaign Against Drug Abuse may once in a while throw in a grant for a project that is in the area of addiction studies. And therefore, what I encourage our attendees and those that are interested is please join in, you know, mobilize your resources and begin programs. And in the process, as you partner with your faculty, then you can become part of projects that could have a component of sponsorship for students within that grant. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. I see many, many uh, expressing thanks to all of you. Uh, I mean, to our speakers. And uh, the next question is by Dixon about how many universities in Africa have started a degree program for drug addictions. So maybe I can start and ask uh, you if you if you have uh, more recent information because the last analysis uh, analysis what was published was what I mentioned before in 2020 in in journal uh, of substance use where we analyzed or available programs what we were able to uh, to to found and uh, what is good to know is that some of these programs are not degree programs in fact and they are uh, some kind of different training and supportive programs uh, and some programs are already exist i mean degree programs and maybe beatrice or rehana or martin have a more recent information if there is increasing number of african programs uh, than we found before in 2020 if you have uh, something new. Thank I you, see. Mikhail, for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that question uh, to our participant. Um, indeed, that data by Professor Mikhail that he just mentioned in the Journal of Substance Use is the most current authentic that we have for Africa. But we also acknowledge that many more institutions if you remember we have the steps that i showed in the model so many more universities are on course towards developing programs but they are somewhere along that uh, staircase that you saw that hierarchy so some are at the level of are uh, doing needs assessment like you have had about south african universities others are at the level of doing the walkthroughs in partnership with isap and colombo plan dap Others are actually at the level, for example, recently we got a communication from uh, Ethiopia. They are interested in, um, you know, they are trying to put together the faculty that we can capacity build for purposes of moving towards developing programs. So I do think in the next three years or so, we are going to begin to see programs, you know, which is basically the outcome of all these activities that we are currently uh, engaging in. Uh, I do know that North Africa, and I hope Dr. Rania is probably on the call. And if she's not, she's part of this team, one of our regional coordinators for North Africa. They're very keen on developing what they're calling an integrated program, which will be offered by several universities in Northern Africa, rather than a program for a single university. So we are encouraging um, a lot of collaborations. And so for now, the data we have is what uh, Professor Mikal mentioned. Um, I can also request Rihanna and Martin if they have something else to add. Thank you. So I think just to reiterate, yeah. uh, it's like what Professor Mikhail's paper <clears throat> is still the latest and it stands as is. So in South Africa, we have two universities that offer a postgraduate diploma in addictions, but also a master's in addiction. And you can specialize with a PhD in, in addictions as a course. So currently, that's where we are at. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Beatrice and Rihanna. I, I think uh, the addition that becoming uh, the two universities uh, uh, approved in in Nigeria, or uh, that already uh, running addition programs in Nigeria. I, I remember very well. I think that paper was published in 2020. Uh, uh, you may correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, these programs were, were approved 2021. So it may be uh, the two additional programs uh, to the, the one as, uh, as earlier published. Uh, subsequent publications may update to reflect 
uh, this uh, or include these two universities. Thank you. Thank you to all uh, of thank you. Thank you, Professor Bikal. Allow me to add one more point that um, sure. one of sure. the things we have discovered in several of our countries is that we want to target both um, professionals already in the field and we also want to target those that would intend to get into the field. And that is why the model of starting a postgraduate diploma is helpful. In my own country and in my own university in Kenyatta, we actually have a postgraduate diploma in addiction treatment science. And it was informed by the realization that many of the people that have an interest in this program already have their own paths of career development. For example, they're already pursuing masters in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. They're already pursuing masters and PhD in counseling psychology, in social work. And we realized that uh, addiction science is a, is a multidisciplinary uh, kind of field. And therefore, we do not want to limit ourselves to or keep away, you know, deny access to people that are actually in the practice and working with these clients, but they've already chosen their paths of career development. So that is why sometimes offering it as a postgraduate diploma mm -hmm. does serve the purpose of giving a specialization, you know, line for those who already have other um, specializations that they have taken. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. And uh, I have a question probably to all of you because there are many comments and very interesting comments regarding uh, real programs, I mean service providers and imbalance situation uh, on um, on the scene of service providers in terms of for instance lack of uh, medical oriented uh, uh, programs and um, some other imbalances in the system and the question is if you can see in your countries and despite the fact that many of these uh, uh, study programs on universities are really young very new and you have a very a little number of years of real existence, but if you can see some first impact on the real world of service providers, and if you can see some positive impact on number of service providers or uh, scale of service providers in terms of more uh, making the system more balanced, can you say something about it uh, from your perspective in your countries? Uh, what do you think about it and if you if you can witnessing some positive impact of your work hmm. uh, thank you very much and uh, i kind of feel excited when i hear that question because um we have got a set of graduates from our pioneer class that was affected by covid and was the, and you know we have a one-year program it's an intensive one-year program of three semesters and two semesters are coursework and the third semester is actually a project and practicum and in the practicum the students get attached in the actual sites where the work is going on where the clients are found and what we found is that the very first bunch of students we sent out for practicum they made such a tremendous impact that they were made they were given responsibilities that we did not anticipate I remember one of them who's a psychiatrist writing me this big message and saying that she made a talk in her psychiatry, you know, orientation meeting. She gave a vote of thanks. And in the process, she mentioned some of the concepts she had learned in our courses. And she was given an appointment the next Monday to be given a job. And she says that Every time her boss keeps saying, if you want to ask any question about addiction, talk to this lady. So she graduated last year and I happened to meet her spouse. And the spouse told me that the wife says that this is the life-changing course that she ever did. She had done a bachelor's in medicine, a master's in psychiatry, and she did this postgraduate diploma. And that is what uh, I, I, have, I have had. But I want to say that when the process of doing a formal impact assessment and i know in our last webinar of africa we did speak with a colleague from south africa who is also trying to do a needs assessment of their program and so in the next couple of months we should be able to have concrete evidence that we can probably publish and talk about in a forum like this about the impact and document the stories and the messages of the employers of these uh, graduates 
as well as the graduates themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Rehana, can you proceed? Yes, so I know time is running out. So very quickly to say that we are also doing currently an impact study of from the very first year that students started with the PG dip right until now. Um, it's one of the students' master's thesis um, project, and it's quite interesting because she will be presenting at the ICUDDR conference in Chiang Mai, where we will actually see the evidence base in terms of what was the impact of the PG dip that we have um, established. So, yeah, so maybe we could have a webinar on that in terms of what's been the impact of what we've been doing. Yeah, yeah, sure, we have to. Martin, would you like to add anything? To this question, uh, I know thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Mika. I think uh, Rihanna and uh, Beatrice have provided insight to that. Uh, from a Nigeria perspective, uh, being that we are still at the early stage of uh, addition programs in the university, so uh, we have not produced um, uh, graduates yet uh, for such evaluation. But we also want to believe that it's a very important aspect that we need to follow up so that we know how much of impact you know, our products are making in the society. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, I received very interesting question, and it's again to all of you. Uh, it's about profiling your graduates, profiling your study programs. And uh, uh, if you can say something about it, because it is about the first, it's about preliminary idea. It's about need assessment. Rehana spoke about it. Uh, what kind of profile can be uh, uh, interested? Uh, what can be the best profile for people graduated from this program for labor market uh, in real labor market? And if you can, if you can say something, why you choose what? What you mixed for your curricula? And what is your experience in terms of profiling your study program? And why you are not or if you are mixing prevention together with treatment with recovery or if you are only mixing treatment or recovery if you have a something uh, about harm reduction and focus on harm reduction if you can say something can you then uh, from your kitchen uh, from your team uh, how, how do you think about it and and what did you do with with this issue how, how did you deal with it hmm. yeah. Who will start? <laughs> Maybe Martin is under process now and he has a big group of people working on well, many things. Mika, thank you for prompting me to, to <laughs> thank you for prompting me to speak. And I have to more or less adjust my seat very well because it is a, it is really a very tough one. But what I have come to realize in this uh, field of addiction is that um, as a multidisciplinary uh, uh, field, it has a way of bringing uh, learning from different professions together. So in other words, you have some from medicine, uh, some from psychology, some from social sciences. And at, at the end, you just discover that even though you're not uh, 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 a graduate of, uh, of medicine or a graduate of psychology, you would have gained uh, uh, a reasonable level of understanding in these different professions or fields. So the extent of being able to manage persons with substance use disorders, even providing uh, prevention intervention. So as multidisciplinary as it is, it is bringing all of these core professions together, especially looking at the core, uh, uh, the course content like we propose in our, in our curriculum. So it has a way of cutting across the different fees, and that is a very strong uh, advantage. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Beatrice. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very well thought out question, uh, participant. And I think this is a very critical thing to think about when you develop a program. And that's why needs assessment is a critical step. So in the needs assessment, part of the target respondents is basically the market players and the market players will tell you what are we seeing what are we lacking and i'm going to give an example of my own university program that we developed so over the years we had students from counseling psychology going for practicum 
they were either at masters or PhD or even bachelors, and they would be placed in addiction treatment centers. And we had a tool where we got feedback from the market to tell us what is our product like? What are the strengths of this student? What are the weak areas? What would you like us to strengthen? And we would then analyze this data and consistently kept telling us our students were not doing well with assessment. They were not doing well with multidisciplinary you know, work with other professionals because they were trained strictly in a limited field of counseling psychology. And so that data was very useful in feeding into our program development for addiction uh, science. At the same time, when we did a needs assessment at that point, we also got additional skills, additional competencies and needs. And so based on this, our program basically cuts across the basic UTC. We adapted the UTC basic. We also brought in a bit of the advanced courses, and we also brought in a bit of the recovery uh, support. Why? Because of the needs that came out of the needs assessment. And therefore, we have got courses on the science of addiction. We have got courses on assessment, the continuum of care. We have courses on family involvement. And then, of course, we then adapted to our local context. And we knew that for our university, a postgraduate student must have skills in research. So we brought in a research course. However, we didn't call it research, actually. We call it measurement in addiction science because we want our students not just do any research, we want them to implement some interventions in addiction practice and see how it works out and document. Then they begin to see the value of evidence base. And then we have got a practicum. And I should finally say, we also brought in a project, which is a requirement of our university. And I should announce here that in the last one year, we, were, we got a grant from ICUDDR, an international um, ISAG. I'm trying to remember what that stands for, the ISAG. And we we're able to develop a course called Publishing Addiction Science. And we want to be able to have these students in this program not only learn how to develop an intervention, implement and measure impact, but also write a project and publish some work out of it. And I'm happy to announce that the current class we have now in the next semester, they will actually be doing the publishing addiction science class. And so we are really needs driven and we are constantly listening to the market players and our students feedback to be able to expand our graduate profile. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Beatrice and Rehana, if you, uh, if you are with us, if you can respond to the question and it will be the last response. Oh, we probably lost connection with Rehana. So I, I, I see that uh, we, we used the time and we are uh, three minutes left. Uh, so thanks so much to all of you, Rehana, Beatrice, Martin. It was very nice to see you again and hear you and, and look at your presentation, very nice presentation. And, and thanks so much for your excellent work, what you did and what you do for your countries, for your continent, and for ICUDPR, and thanks so much again. And uh, uh, I would like to also express my thanks again to Kerry Hopkins, Rudolf Nordway, and Olivia Woodrow for supporting us and, and making backup for us. And uh, of course, last but not least, I would like to express my special thanks also uh, towards RNL for sponsoring and your governments, our governments for sponsoring our work and allowed uh, us to do what, what we think that we should to do. So thank you very much for attending today webinar and hopefully it was useful and, and fruitful to all of you. And uh, I thought that we have uh, approximately 300 participants today, and that's that's pretty nice. And I was, and I am still really happy that uh, that we can we can do it together. And and have a nice day. Take care, and see you next time on some other webinar or conference by organized by or ISAP. Thank you very much, and see you. Thank you, Mika. Thank you, Beatrice and Hannah. Bye. Yeah. Bye.